Conclusion Let's summarize what we've done so far. Do you remember the 10 principles? Do you recall the 10 cases and pieces of legislation? How about the title of the book? Can you call to mind what this book is all about? The title of this book is Who Owns the Family? I've tried to answer this question by means of 10 principles, all developed around 10 pieces of legislation and or cases that have changed family life in America. Principle 1. The Principle of Sacred Covenant I started with Covenant, not Contract. Why? The place to begin in answering the question, who owns the family, is here. In a famous case in 1888, Maynard v. Hill, it was established that the family is not a mere contract, but a sacred covenant, an institution. I defined a sacred covenant as a five-fold bond, using the book of Deuteronomy as a model. A marriage covenant consists of the following. Transcendence, hierarchy, ethics, sanctions and continuity. A bond Using this basic grid, the outline of the principles themselves followed the five points of the covenant twice. So, the first chapter establishes that the family is created by God. It is transcendent because it is a sacred covenant. It, not the state, is the trustee of children. Principle 2. The principle of authority. Chapter 2 is called, By Whose Authority? Recent legislation particularly New Jersey UTLO, encroaches on the family. In this particular case, it was ruled that teachers are not surrogate parents. The case was used to limit the power of teachers to search, but in the process, the whole zone of education was taken away from the parents. The principle in this chapter is that God is the authority. Neither state nor family have final authority over the family. God does and God entrusts the family with a delegated authority. Principle 3. The Principle of Law The chapter is called By What Standard? I wanted to emphasise that the state does not determine the standard for the family. I used the famous Nebraska Extra Latio Douglas v. Faith Baptist Church. The issue was By What Standard? Will children of the church be raised and educated? Faith Baptist Church argued that their standard was the Bible. Since God has delegated his standard to the family, as well as to every sphere of society, I use the Ten Commandments as a guide, relating each commandment to show the ramifications of biblical law. Principle 4. The Principle of Sanctions 1. I referred to the amazing Snyder case, where parents tried to take their incorrigible daughter to the state for disciplinary help. Instead of helping them, the state bent the law to take their daughter away. The Bible gives parents the authority to discipline. Sure, they can give an incorrigible teenager over for serious discipline, but the state has no right to take children from the parents, unless the parents are genuinely abusing the child. So that biblical discipline is understood, I presented biblical methods of punishment. Principle 5. The principle of inheritance. Family inheritance was the title of this chapter. Here I presented the damaging legislation of the 16th Amendment, the income tax law. Why was it so damaging? It was made a tax on success, the first graduated tax in our nation's history. This cut into the inheritance of families. Why is inheritance important? It is a powerful tool for building up families over the generations. Of course, inheritance is intangible, character traits, etc., and tangible. If parents can pass on a spiritual and fiscal legacy, they are arming the next generation with an inheritance that can overcome the world, the flesh and the devil. 
In the last half of this chapter, using the inheritance passages of the Bible, I summarized some guidelines for parents to keep in mind. Principle 6. The Principle of Life Who Owns Life was the name of this chapter. Keeping in mind the covenantal grid, I restated the five points of a sacred covenant. This parallels the sixth of the Ten Commandments. You shall not murder. The important legislation here is Roe versus Wade. For the first time, the state set itself up as the final determinant of life and death. The Bible says that this privilege belongs only to God. Since God considers unborn babies human beings, so should the state. The most serious problem with Roe vs. Wade is that it destroyed the whole concept of due process, the right of trial by jury. Principle 7 is the principle of sexual privacy. One case that I considered was People vs. Onofre. The other was Griswold vs. Connecticut. The issue was the boundary of sexual privacy. The first case placed sexual privacy outside of marriage. All kinds of sexual perversity were allowed. Homosexuality, lesbianism, etc. Does this mean the Bible is against sex? No. God created man and woman, so he is not against sex. He's against sex outside of marriage. In the remainder of the chapter, I presented some basic principles for sex in marriage. Principle 8. The Principle of Worldview The title of the chapter is Whose Worldview? I wanted to discuss the whole question of education, but the real issue at risk is worldview. In Ohio v. Wisner, it was established that education determines a child's entire worldview, which makes education a religious question. Evidently, the state saw this because it said, quote, The real question is not which religion is the best religion, but how shall the best be secured? End quote. What is the correct worldview? Using the covenantal grid of the first chapter, I briefly developed a covenantal worldview. Principle 9. The Principle of Protection This chapter was called Who Protects the Family? And how? I use the famous Quinlan case to demonstrate that the family needs other institutional protection. The state protects the family by implementing the capital offence laws of the Bible, seeing all of these crimes are directly against the family. The church, however, protects the family by being a true guardian of the needs of the family. The church, and not the state, is given this responsibility. Conclusion Principle 10 The Principle of Generational Growth The final principle is called Who Owns the Future Generation? It's about the generational expansion of Christianity. In a famous case involving Mr Armstrong, 1842, a minister tried to rebaptize his daughter after she had already been baptized. The court ruled the minister was out of line interfering with the covenantal obligations of Mr. Armstrong as father. The biblical basis for this ruling was even included in the judge's remarks. Why? Scripture teaches that children are part of the covenant and to be claimed by God. In this chapter, I included three basic guidelines for rearing a Christian dynasty. Destiny, discipline, dominion. This is a future orientation of the family. God entrusts it to the parents. Summary. So, I've presented the 10 principles of family ownership. This chapter has attempted to provide a brief summary, but the task is not complete. We still need to apply what we've learned about the family. By way of application, I want to discuss what the family, church, and state can do to put the trusteeship of the family back into the parents' hands. In the following chapter, I want to begin with the family. What can the family do? Is it helpless? 
are there specific things your family can be doing? Yes. Let's turn to the next chapter to find out.